Okay. Oh, we're recording. Okay. All right. Welcome to Star. Or woohoo! Today we'll be talking about the history of sci-fi. Basically, going through like being like its earliest conception to like right now. So like, and there's a lot to go through. So, well, first announcement. Next week we'll be discussing biopunk. Basically, it's a sub set of jobs. Of sci-fi genre that explores elements of biology, whether it's like experimental, experimentalism, alien, or whatever. That will be run next week on Monday. Buy membership. If you want to be a member at Star, talk to Aaron, who's not here. So talk to the hammer. What? Yes, talk to Fine. Talk to Hammer after the mission. So yeah, uh, some of the perks of being a member is you, you get to earn ranks, uh, get discounts for stuff like t-shirts and Starfest, and purchase tickets for us for our movie outings. Speaking of movies, last week we went to see the Lego movie, too. We had a blast, it was a great movie, and that good amount of people showed up uh, in our next movie outing. But to help us decide this, we are debating whether we should go see our movies on Fridays or Saturdays. We'll be releasing a poll on it later tonight. So. If, if you think that if you're thinking that Fridays or Saturdays will work better for you for our movies, please vote. All right, hey, book club is back and it's at six birdies on Mondays. Uh, yeah, book club is a real hoot, so be sure to come. Oh yeah. Uh, what was the book called? Yeah. All right, so yeah, book club is gonna be doing a, gonna start reading Childhood Ends next week. So if you room, if you want to delve into that, that, then come join book club, six thirty Mondays. All right, we also oh, PR is on Thursdays from seven to nine. PR is our committee in which we design our posters and and basically is a way for us to reach out to the kiddos and stuff. So. It's also a great way to, for you to learn stuff like Photoshop or GIMP if you're cheap. Um, so yeah, join PR Thursdays. Yes, Zach. That's true too. We could always use more people to hang out posters. RT is a big campus, and there's a, and there's all so the more the merrier. It's also, you can still earn PR points in which you can exchange for prizes at the end of the semester. Last year, I earned a little Steven Universe figure because of that. Sure, if Mike Solo is around. But yeah, talk to Mike Solo if you're interested. We also have a Slack, uh, RT Star in the Slack, I believe. You, you, it's a good way hey, to join, up, join us there and you can discuss all things nerdy, such as Nintendo, anime, movies, uh, whatever. It's a, good, it's a good way to like express your inner nerdiness. Want to run a mission like us? Go to IHaveAnIdea.RTStar.com and submit an idea for a mission. You can present a mission, much like we are, are doing tonight. Hey, in fact, the person who, in fact, our next mission is going to be presented by someone who did just that. So, yeah, it's a great way. It's also a good way to boost your confidence. It's public speaking. Okay? Star registration for Starfest is now open. Woo! Starfest is our annual sci fi convention at RIT. It's a lot of fun. There's vendors, there's panels, and, and cosplay and stuff. It's a lot of fun. And so, if you want to register, um, I believe there's a link to it on our website. All right. However, feeling cheap, can't afford Starfest because you spend all your money on textbooks? Don't worry. There's a way you can attend Starfest for free. Volunteering. Help out with Starfest. As if you help out at Starfest with a certain amount of time, you can enjoy the rest of the convention. The convention is about how 
How many hours long? Yeah, about eight to ten ish hours, I'd say. And you would only need to volunteer for two hours or so. Oh, oh, what one hour if you're doing a panel, I believe is correct. Yeah. So if you're already hosting a panel with us, you only need to volunteer for an additional hour, and then you can go enjoy Starfest for free. There's a lot of cool panels that we can. That will be it's a real hoot. Finally, we have a variety of sodas for sale. These are all time related sodas. We got the Sprite of Sci Fi's Past, the Pepsi of Sci Fi's Present, and the Coca Cola of Sci Fi Things to Come. And one single Coke Zero Cherry, which is now, which I can proud to say has now been sold. Thank you, kind sir. Thank you. We didn't make it, but thank you. <laughs> All right, now enough of hearing me talk. Let's get ready for our mission. <sighs> hey guys, I uh. Uh, sorry, sorry. Uh, I'm supposed to be presenting with my friend Doc. I'm not, I guess he's not here yet. Um, uh, he didn't tell me a whole lot of information ahead of time. Um, uh, but I, I think I saw that there's a presentation in the folder. So maybe we're set? Yeah, it, it seems like there's something. So, where's Doc? Whatever. I know I'm not here, right? Maybe that will help me stall for a little bit of time. First, I need to set up a little bit. It's going to blow your mind. You won't even believe it. Oh, my gosh. Okay, and I need you guys to start thinking about numbers. Think about your favorite number. Q. Q? Keep keep shouting them out. Keep going. Essentially, a tale of a guy, a king even, going out 
fighting demons, fighting gods even, uh, uh, in this pursuit of immortality. Um, and although several of the elements are clearly fantasy and uh, uh, based upon uh, magic, there are still several uh, sci-fi uh, elements and motifs within it. Uh, for example, they speak about uh, this terrible apocalypse that came much earlier. Um, uh, and that flood would actually uh, uh, be supported by other potential uh, uh, apocalypse theories that, that, that might have happened around the time. And uh, it, the main theme is while, like, while the story itself is not at all, yeah. the main themes are about ma a man accepting death, which is a sci-fi theme in later works, even though this itself isn't really seen to be sci-fi. Um, in, in a much larger scale, um, uh, sci-fi does usually start uh, looking at the differences uh, between uh, man and God and the uh, hubris that man shows in his pursuit to become like God um, uh, and kind of along those lines. And Gilgamesh was not the first early sci-fi that was kind of a sci-fi. In some mythology, in some of his work, it has sci-fi elements within it. Uh, Hephthys, the Greek god of craftsmanship, had metal men help him, and they're described robotic-like, even though the word robot wasn't invented. Uh, and there's some, there's a Chinese myth, there's several Chinese myths actually, that deal with uh, someone meeting an autonomon and it being declared like one of the greatest crafts in the land and it ends up dealing with kind of flying too close to the sun and all that um and there's also in 1001 or 18 nights oh, which you want to okay, there's a lot of stories that have mirror science fiction elements between like a city on the moon about um uh filled with all of these animated puppets um uh but here there's also another story where um uh, there's this ebony horse, and more or less, uh, by using a key, you can activate it and fly around on it. Uh, and it's mechanical, and it's um, kind of strangely close to how it, how you know, uh, uh, transportation works nowadays. Um, but you know, because it's so early, is it is, is it really? Um, Clearly, this was not the intention that they had going into it. They thought it was magic. They thought this was an actual creation story or along these lines of uh, thinking. So does it still count as sci-fi if that was not their original intent, but it still kind of mirrors sci-fi? Anyone has any input? This is, by the way, a debate outside of this room. <laughs> yeah, no, it's, it's a big thing. Go for it, Deborah. Yeah. I think technologies would have looked very futuristic at the time, even if they're not futuristic or silly nowadays. So, and I mean, you see that there's a lot of more recent sci-fi too, like 2001 Space Odyssey and like space telephone booths, which you don't use anymore. <laughs> you know, I think I kind of see it the same way. Like, it is trying to make predictions about the future of the technology based on the information available at the time, so you're still trying to be the young and how they want to Yeah, that's a very uh, good point. Um, and kind of uh, like tacking on to that, uh, the, the idea of you know science versus uh, magic has kind of always been up there where uh, a science that you don't understand is kind of perceived as magic. So that, that muddles this even further um, because magic can just be perceived as something you just don't totally understand. Um, and I think we uh, need to go back to the future a little bit further. Whoa, whoa, gift. I'll look at that, we're there. Uh, yeah, so moving on to the 19th century, we starts uh, kicking in. Um, and looking a little bit more like sci-fi, like we recognize. This is where the sci-fi genre starts to emerge. 
HG Wells, uh, which HG Wells was kind of imagining what would the future be like because he's kind of very curious about the pro projection of humanity, which is a time that people are making strides in a lot of places. So he thought of the time machine, story, uh, which I actually really like their explanation of how time travel works, even if according to physics now that's not how it works, where they there's three dimensions, which are space, and then the fourth one is time, and it's just a machine that travels along the fourth dimension. And even though it's not really how it works, it's really neat idea and it's kind of very logical um and it is technically in the romanticism era even though it's not really a romanticism novel it's very different because romanticism usually doesn't totally try to think in that way uh but it was also a take on like analyzing the current societies at the time because it dealt with this is what classism could be eventually uh it is a really neat novel if you guys have Although it still did have some scientific uh, romanticism elements, uh, where the main characters would go on this big voyage or odyssey, uh, just just uh, uh, as several other stories uh, did, particularly some of Verne's stories, like Journey to the Center of the Earth, um, where essentially this professor decodes this um, uh, uh, this ancient glyph and finds out that these kings. Uh, found a way through a volcano into the center of the earth. And although it's not based on a ton of science fact, there's a lot of interesting scientific phenomenon that they have throughout. And in the center of the earth, there's like illuminated by these uh, bioluminescent um, fungi and there's like prehistoric creatures and fauna. And it, you know, it's a little ridiculous, um, but that was really popular around this time, especially with burn. Uh, he did like 20,000 leagues under the sea, and um, I think he had another really big one, but it's slipping my mind, of course. That was him. Yeah. Although it was, it was, it was one of his big adventure novels. Although it was a little bit less in the sci-fi area because they didn't do anything super far outlandish in sci-fi, um, other than the fact that they made it around the world in 80 days, which is more just a fact. Um, but yeah, it, it was a super popular theme, um, and it was very fun, but it didn't really make any big statements about mankind as a whole. It was just like, man, this was a good adventure. I want to read another one. Uh, and finally, uh, Frankenstein, kind of yeah. an outlier from and, the theme we had going. Um, it, it's an outlier for a lot of reasons, actually. So this, um, a lot of people consider it to be the first true sci-fi. Um, but it's not an adventure story in the slightest. It's really about like the statement. It's more going into the, what H.G. Wells was originally going into, which was like about man itself. And it's kind of a dark look at man overall because the I have a thing here that knowledge is known that Frankenstein is not the monster, but wisdom is knowing Frankenstein was the monster because the whole story kind of paints the doctor, which is the human and usually the protagonist in stories, as not a good guy overall. He does a lot of bad things, and the creature is a very sympathetic character, and by the end of it, you end up liking the creature a lot as a really bad for him. Uh, and I just want to make this clear. This is, you guys all have an image of Franks on your mind. These are drawings of what people think the creature looks like based on the descriptions in the book. There's no nuts and bolts coming out or anything. That didn't really come till later. Uh, it's, it's just supposed to be more of a horrifying creature versus a green man that has bolts. Um, and also uh, something that makes it more of an outlier. It's one of the few stories at the time, even still, that this is, was written by a woman. Uh, to the point that it was originally, I looked into this last night a bit, it was originally um, published anomalous, uh, anomalously without an author because the uh, husband and her were afraid of what people would think. So the first two weeks, it didn't have a name attached to it in the slightest, but as it got became more and more popular, they said, okay, we'll put my name on it. And immediately when her name got it, 
all of a sudden people came out of the woodwork and said it was about uh, Shockingly. Um, like, basically, they were like, oh, well, this part is obviously because she has female tendencies. And it's like, okay, you weren't saying this. Like, um, but it still holds up really well. And it does have an impact on history. And they, she did end up writing other stuff, uh, not as popular, but yeah, uh, it is a really big deal. And it also takes started the Gothic horror genre, which we're not going into today, but yeah. um, really neat. Also, be an interesting juxtaposition between this and uh, Gilgamesh because uh, at first I was a little bit skeptical about Gilgamesh being a sci-fi as well. But if you think about that um, man trying to be God, but then ultimately failing, this is a perfect example because this is a person trying to create life and then the life being angry at them and being kind of just this hideous monster and ultimately causing their own downfall. Um, it, it, it's like like a very interesting mirror. And this, this pops up uh, very often in the sci-fi genre. Uh, yeah. There's a lot of stuff, and we she did have a stillborn child, and there is an entire theory going into like this is her feeling bad about having a child and. It's, it gets messy. Um, but also, like, there's people that go as far to the stage this day that kind of makes me mad that it wasn't actually her that wrote it, but saying she wrote it, including her husband saying multiple times at the time, no, she absolutely wrote it. Stop asking me. So I don't know why that's a thing, but yeah. Yeah, yes. Thank you, Ava. <laughs> no, you're fine. <laughs> Anywho. <laughs> okay, so uh, moving forward a little bit later, uh, a century, um, uh, we, we move up to the 20th century. Um, uh, around this time, uh, let's just let's remember that um, World War I is kind of uh, well, uh, occurring around uh, here. Um, uh, and jump into immediately 1984. Uh, now, 1984, for those of you who have not read or heard about it, it's essentially um, a story about this man named Winston who uh, lives in this dystopia. Um, <clears throat> uh, and the government is set up in such a way that uh, there is no way to rise up over the government and you are perfectly oppressed so that they can get the most work out of you um, for the least, um, uh, uh, while also giving you the least amount to do the work. Um, and the story systematically goes throughout the entire government, uh, fleshing out all of the areas and how difficult it, uh, it would be to get through it. For example, they remove certain words from the dictionary. So you can't. So when you say something is bad, the definition of bad now means uh, either bad or if you're talking about the government, good. Um, so it's it's impossible to have a thought against the government. Um, and they have monitors all over the place that uh, are constantly keeping an eye on you, uh, making sure that you're not collaborating with other people to uh, get out of the government. And right as the protagonist thinks that he's about to join this group uh, uh, organizing to um, rebel against the government, and it turns out tricking him into uh, uh, revealing his agendas and then throwing him into jail and then later executing him. Um, this is a very strong timepiece. Uh, in this era, there were tons of stories like this, where they talked about this dystopian future uh, um, where the government is oppressing people, kind of because at the time everyone was afraid of uh, fascism taking over uh, and people being oppressed like they are in these stories. I think Fahrenheit 451 was also around this area. Stranger. Great New World was it? it was like a little later, not that much later. Uh, I think it was... Okay, yeah. Uh, Brave New World was Yeah, yeah. Um, and yeah, that's just because a lot of people were very frightened about fascism and the rising up there. 
Um, and I, I feel like this has had like a very strong influence on people's perception of fascism. Well, uh, uh, Orson Welles, this handsome man right here, um, uh, he, he did all kinds of stories like this. Uh, he, he also did Animal Farm. Um, and really, once you do read this, it, it changes your perspective because it is strangely accurate to the way we're living nowadays. Like, he predicted before cameras existed, digital cameras at least, I'm not sure, like, photography, but before cameras existed, um, he predicted that they would have monitors that they could see through and watch your every move. And there's kind of security cameras everywhere nowadays. And it's, yeah. Um, yeah, it's a, it's a little spooky. Um, moving forward. Oh, yeah. Um, so, uh, the War of the Worlds. Uh, I was to say, this was, this is based off a novel written by H.G. Before, because the radio show is also really important, we decided to talk about the radio show. Well. Yeah. Uh, we wanted to talk about fashion. So. Also, also, the book came just two years before the thing, and this really fits better into this era. Um, so we, we went with the radio show because it also shows off a new form of media that sci-fi takes on. Um, so the War of the Worlds is a very is in a very interesting story. Uh, the idea is essentially um, these aliens, um, these Martians come down in these tripods, like you can see here, uh, and they have these huge tentacles that grab people and throw them into this net, and they have uh, heat rays. And without very much resistance, relatively, um, they're able to almost completely dominate the world, destroy all of the governments, uh, uh, very few people are uh, alive or free from the experiments that they were doing on people. Um, uh, except at the very end, um, all of the tripods just start falling. People just leave the uh, containment areas. No, nothing seems to stop them. Uh, and after uh, looking into it a little bit later, they find out that the aliens all died because of the common cold. Um, which again is that motif. Um, uh, man cannot be like God because God just strike down this uh, formidable force that none of our weapons could even touch with just like the most humble of things, just the cold. True. That was the least annoying part of that movie. <laughs> <laughs> And when this yeah. was made, this was at the height of the Cold War, which that was a re-emerging thing. So it's like, oh my God, tomorrow, like we can get nerds. Um, yeah. so Yeah, and it it makes sense. Um, I I uh, yeah. yeah, 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 he had no, he had no concept of writing this or of course. 
And then also structurally, it makes sense that you could easily take them out because they have three legs. And tables, you know that a table that has three legs after you remove one generally is no longer a table. Um, so this story actually comes with a second story. Um, so it came out in uh, 98, like we said before, and it was taking advantage of the uh, fin de salice, uh, or, or the uh, end of the century, this kind of fear that people had that at the end of the century, the world might end as well. Um, it repeated itself with Y2K, but uh, people were a little bit scared about this. So uh, when it came on the radio, um, people actually started freaking out because they were like, wait, is this actually happening right now? Especially during the 30 minute transition where they just had music, people would come in after and they didn't hear the beginning where it's like, this is a fictional story. And they're like, what? This is happening now? There was, there was genuine uh, uh, reactions from people and it, it got really poor reviews uh, uh, in the newspapers and stuff critically just because it scared so many people, but it only worked in- There was even some people or journalists put the news reports trying to cover it. As absurd as that is, like, like it was like it, I don't think any were ever published, but like they were working on it, and then like none of that was news it was just a thing, like a fiction. But like this skit terrified people. Yeah, so, which which is really funny, and uh, later it did lead to the um, creation of the multi-stage rocket and the liquid fuel rocket, which are both kind of pivotal for science. Okay. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. They didn't even call it a laser. That's a very good point. I didn't even think about that. They call it a heat ray because they didn't really have a concept of a laser at the time. Um, what the laser was now. Yeah. Kind of, it's, it's very uh, remarkable, the fact that it is kind of coming closer and closer to being true, even if the alien part didn't pan out so well. <laughs> okay, moving on. Uh, we're going forward to the golden age. Yeah, so these are the big three authors at the time. There were more authors, and these writers, all three of these writers were not just writing this time, but this time period is really defined by these three works because they all have the same publicness, I think. And that publicist was just trying to push all three of them. Uh, and um, it's really funny because uh, I don't really know much about Heinlein's relationship with the other two, but these two had a really weird relationship where at first it was a flame war going on for decades, uh, where they would go, uh, like, Asimov would publish something, and then Clark would immediately shred it in a review, and, like, Asimov would do the same thing to Clark. And eventually, this came up to a point where they happened to be sharing a cab in New York City, of all things. And there was what is now called infamously as the Asimov Clark Treaty, where they, they came to the conclusion that Clark was the better science fiction writer, but Asimov was the better science writer. And if you know about their two works, it makes a lot of sense that that's what they came to. And uh, Clark later, like, and when he was like uh, writing something else, I think it was, I don't remember what it was, but uh, he wrote uh, from the second best science writer to the second best science fiction writer. So they did eventually become friends, but it's just really weird that they started as like hateful enemies, because how dare you, you're like, eat my equal, then all of a sudden they uh, like kind of became friends. Uh, the only thing I ever found about Heinlein's relationship with the other two is apparently Clark and Heinlein had a bit of a fight over, like, I, I think it was about de-arming after World War II, like, like philosophy stuff, um, but they did eventually reconcile it. Just, their relationships are kind of really weird, specifically these two. Um, so yeah. Uh, also, yeah, and I'm going to talk about it a little bit. It's not the story I'm talking about, but it is important to the story I'm talking about. Okay, so, um, oh, I guess I answered this question. But, 
Um, okay, so um, Isaac Asimov, um, who is sometimes considered the biggest of the big three, in my opinion, he is. And a lot of you know, people go back and forth. It's an opinion thing. Um, he did a lot of short stories uh, uh, on a, a couple different topics, um, but I think you could kind of summarize them into his uh, robotic series, his foundation series, and just kind Galactic of Empire. Oh, is that a separate yeah. Galactic Empire? And then um, just kind of his mystery series, where not even sci fi, just kind of mysteries. They were fun. Um, uh, uh, but yeah, the robotic series kind of just covered these, uh, uh, more, the, the sooner sci-fi, sooner futuristic sci-fi, uh, era where humans are building robots. Um, the foundation series is in the distant distance. The foundation future. series is really neat. It's about, um, basically it's psycho history. Uh, there's a guy that's a psycho historian and psycho history basically means you use map to predict what large populations will do in the future and using this map he figured out that the galactic empire is eventually going to collapse and go into a dark ages similar to how rome fell and went into a, when europe was in the middle of the dark ages and he told this to the galactic empire and they laughed at him uh so then he said fine i'll make sure the dark ages is shorter because we can't exactly stop it but and he made two separate foundations, which is where the series comes from. And they were both supposed to be like, this is where all the scientific knowledge is going to be. So we'll shorten the Dark Ages from like, I think it was like 2,000 years, like 700 years. Um, and the foundation series is about what the foundation government does politically and how it deals with, because there's like a group of people that are still claiming to be the Galactic Empire, even though they're not really anymore, and just their surrounding areas. And it's more political in nature than his other stuff. Uh, yeah. We, we looked at the date because I, yeah, we looked at the date because uh, I remember when we were doing this that technically the robot universe and the Galactic Empire universe and the Foundation universe are all the same timeline, and I think these are more the the robot stuff is like the twenty six hundred, like the twenty the twenty first century, like nowish, and the Galactic Empire series is like oh my god, it was like twelve thousand or twenty four thousand. Well, yeah, it's it's like it's kind of even. Well, it takes place in around twelve thousand something in the Galactic. Yeah, that was it. So it's like 30. This point is like, yeah, there are fantastic universes where things are tens of thousands of years off of each other. So it doesn't really matter whether it can It's just, it's neat that he like connected them or tried to. Um, it's, like, it's like saying a movie about the cavemen giving the MCU. <laughs> <laughs> it kind of is, though. Yeah. Yeah. There's a word for it, but you can't really get that. Uh, I think it's going to be some sort of description of this guy's life. Now, I'm not sure if he's going to be broken by hand first and then type it, but that's, that's a stream of consciousness. He didn't have a word processing. So, like, write everything on Friday night and then go back on Monday and you know, make adjustments. It's even more insane because the first foundation book, which is the book that kickstarted his career and is considered one of the best science fiction novels to this day, he wrote it at like 20 or something. It's insane. <laughs> like, yeah, like when I learned that, I was like, I feel so. <laughs> like, um, but, yeah, and, like he just poured it out. I, I think it's incredible. Um, but. Yeah, especially the short stories. Like, um, I'll, I'll just kind of give you a little taste of uh, his his work uh, in the robotic series, at least, because we definitely can't go like too much deeper into the other stuff because that'll be its own mission, probably, if we try. Um, so this this short story is called Evidence. 
Um, essentially, uh, uh, this runner for uh, congressman, uh, the story begins with this person who's running to be the congressman. Uh, uh, oh, no, the district of attorney um, is hit by a car. Um, and uh, after he recovers, he's elected the district of attorney. Um, uh, but his uh, competitors, while they're gearing up for campaigning uh, in the re-election, uh, his political machine, which uh, uh, tells him essentially um, there's no way that he could have like come out of that car car wreck uh, without being disfigured or crippled. So the fact that he's not only neither of those two things, but still healthy enough to actually like be the district of attorney is impossible. Um, so he starts hypothesizing hypothesizing that he might be a robot taking the place of the actual district of attorney. And he goes over some evidence and he's like, well, we don't have any confirmation of anyone seeing him eat or sleep after uh, the car crash. Um, and whenever they ask for like physical inspection, um, uh, he always says, you do not have a right to physically inspect me. I can decline this because I am still a human until you prove that I'm a robot which, you know, makes sense. And then he even makes, if you reelect me, I'll fight for your right to do that too. Um, <laughs> uh, so uh, what they had to do was they had to um, uh, look to the three laws of robotics to try to help him, help them uh, figure out if he is actually a robot or not. Um, the three laws of robotics created by Mr. Mutton Shops over here um, uh, are as, uh, as goes. Um, the first law is a robot may not harm a human or through inaction allow a human come into harm. The second law is um, a robot must obey all commands given to him by a human uh, unless it violates the first law. And the third law is a robot must protect themselves uh, and their own uh, uh, existence unless it conflicts with the first or second law. Um, and these laws were designed for, so that robots didn't try to take over Terminator style. Um, and it kind of makes sense considering they're smart enough to think like us, but uh, we use them essentially as slaves. Um, and this also kind of encouraged them to think, hey, maybe district of attorney is a robot because he doesn't want to, uh, uh, he doesn't really vouch for the uh, death penalty and uh, he hasn't convicted any innocent man. Um, and the story, uh, goes deeper and people are harassing him now because some, he brought it up. Uh, everyone kind of suspects him of doing this. And eventually at one of the, uh, uh, one of his speeches, uh, someone walks up on stage and is like, just punch me in the face, prove it. And, you know, he clocks him. Uh, uh, he has a big bruise. He's finally proven, but I don't think he's reelected because he punched the guy in the face. Like, um, but at the very end, uh, it turns out the people who did transfer the consciousness uh, from the physical body to the robot um, were aware the whole time that he was a robot and didn't give any insight on it. And they decided to keep it a secret because they thought that having a robot as a leader would be better than uh, having a human as a leader. Uh, and that was kind of one of the motifs that he had in the robot series. Um, is kind of like, yeah, he established the three laws and yes, creation over man. Go for it. Is it what? Maybe. Um, so I would not be surprised. There's a sequel to this story of like a meeting with, because like eventually this guy becomes president. And like, he actually is a really good president and like creates basically a world government. Um, but it's more of a utopia type of thing. So I don't know. I'm surprised if it was influenced by that. Um, but yeah, it brings us back to um, man's creation rising up over him. And in this case, it's a little bit more optimistic because it's not rising over us in the you created me, now I hate you, Frankenstein kind of sense. It's more like, you created me and now we're better than you, but we still want to support you because you made us nice people. Which is, you know, I, I prefer the optimistic views uh, as far as science fiction goes. Uh, so I'm gonna go quick before we move on. I just want to say like, 
I somewhat like a thing I really appreciated about the robot series is like so the ro I robot short story collection is all about these two people that are go around the gal like galaxy galaxy and like their entire point is to debug robots but every single problem ends up being it's just the three laws being really weird and as a computer programmer I love that because it's like this makes perfect sense to me because it happens literally all the time it's like why is this robot walking in a circle it's because the three laws made it do it <laughs> like it's nothing it's not doing anything wrong technically it's just doing that because you told it yes <laughs> uh, and, and like it, it made me appreciate that and then I found out afterwards Asimov was an electrical engineer so it's like now this makes perfect sense <laughs> so he knew it so he wrote about it um, so yeah so I'm going to talk about Arthur C. Clarke now who he wrote a lot of stuff I don't know if people can read this by the way um, he wrote a lot of stuff and this is actually one of his earlier works it's I think 19 um, but he submitted this story called, um, at this point he was writing, um, a, like sci-fi, but it was more like feel goody. And then he, there was a BBC competition where he wrote the story called the Sentinel of Eternity, which is about a man going to the moon and seeing a very strange object that appears to be artificial but it can't be because there's not many people on the moon, but it also can't, it's not natural, so who put it there? And if this sounds familiar, it should be because Arthur C. Clarke does eventually write 2001 Space Odyssey. Um, and like, it's, this entire story is about like, kind of like, you're not alone, but we don't know what that means. Uh, and, the like this is kind of like his the description of the object he finds at this point it's not described as a black obelisk or anything um but and doesn't give a definite answer the narrator does give his thoughts of it being some kind of test for like when it's found because it's on the moon of a race of, of a like a living species of sentient species once they find this object, we know that it lets out a signal of you are now space travel worthy. So maybe it sends out a signal of some sort to who created it, but it doesn't give a definite answer. It's just the narrator speculating. So, and it's kind of this scary, but kind of also inspiring thing. Uh, and Clark, this kind of changed Clark's career a lot because the next story he wrote, Childhood's End, which we're reading in book club, um, is kind of like a continuation of this idea. I'm not, I'm just, that, I, that's all I know about it. It just, it continues this idea. And eventually he meets up with Stanley Kubrick and Stanley Kubrick and him write 2001 A Space Odyssey, which is also a continuation of this idea, but from what I know, also very different from both Childhood's End and this. Um, so yeah, um, it's neat. It's literally six pages if you're interested. Uh, I Googled it last night and found it. So it, you can find it pretty easily. <laughs> um, yeah. Uh, so then there's Stranger to Strange Land, which is written by Heinlein. And before this, Heinlein's uh, works are more the word is juvenile, which is interesting because I wouldn't, I don't know if I'd use it because the other big work he's known for is Starship Troopers, which if you know of it, you probably know of the movie, which the movie is all feel kill bugs. Uh, but the book is like kind of a deconstruction on why fascism doesn't work. The, yeah, the movie the movie has the same point, but has a very different tone, and I kind of like that. Like, it's an interesting adaptation. Um, but the book is a more serious take and more pointing out like 
this makes no sense. Why would I do things this way? And it's like, that's because how fascism works. Kind of thing. It also kind of has like the opposite thing of like other like sci-fi stories, which is really funny, at least the movie, which is like um spoilers for the movie, I guess, like very mild. Uh, but like it ends up being that they're a hive mind and they're all technically sentient. And instead of being like, oh my god, what have we done? They destroyed the hell out of the, the queen and go, we did it. And it's like, this is totally not, we're, they're not the good guys. Um, but uh, anywho, I talk. <laughs> Um, but yeah, so it, he did that, which at the time was apparently considered juvenile, and he wanted to change that. So he wrote Stranger to Strange Land, which is really weird from what I have read. Um, it is, it's banned in schools uh, I, to this day. It's like really, it was really controversial because it basically said it openly talks about sex a lot. Is basically like the point. Uh, this was even more different because, like, uh, I'm gonna, t I'm gonna talk about the main church in a minute. Um, it, I don't know if it started the hippie movement. I couldn't find anything, but when it was published, it doesn't seem illogical to say that. But it definitely heavily influenced it because the main religion. So, Stranger Strange Lines is about a man that was raised on Earth going to Mars and finding that Mars has this utopian society, but the utopian society is a very strange one because they openly have sex, polyamory is accepted, um, and like traditional family structure is like rejected entirely. Uh, and there's also some paganistic mentalities in it. So it's just really weird. Um, and it makes a lot of sense to like, for me to say, like, I think this at least influenced the movement, but even more than that, even more than that, click next for a minute. The Church of All Worlds, which is what I was describing, is real because of this book. Someone made it, and it's you can sign up for it, like, and it's in California, and like, it's all about like people trying to like love each other and like be pagans and like i don't know they they give themselves sci-fi names like the leaders called Oberon. <laughs> yes <laughs> i think it might be so i now have is not a member of said organization, but well, was not. It, this started during the hidden movement. Um, he was never a member of said organization, but when they were founding it, they wrote a letter to him, and he wrote back, and they became pen pals. And like, uh, apparently, we know for a fact that at one point he subscribed to their newsletter, so <laughs> it's, it's really funny. Um, <laughs> But yeah, so like this it influenced the world and it's now in the Library of Congress because it is culturally influential. Um, yeah. <laughs> so. Yep. So originally, Stuff I would kind of look like as, as a, uh, a genre fiction, which is not not a compliment as far as uh, uh, criticisms go. It, it was kind of looked at as cheap and like you just pump it out with the same formula over and over again. You know, you go on the adventure, you come back out. It's a fun time, but there's no substance to it. 
this is when it actually started getting refined with the big three. Uh, they made it kind of more of a work of art. They worked with the formula, but at the same time, they added to it. They talked more about man himself uh, uh, and made these like, like awesome work considered the big three. It's because they really transformed the genre. And it moves on to the new wave, the 1960s and, and the 1970s. Now, even though they transformed the genre, it did kind of become, you know, a, a nerd thing. People were like, you see, sci-fi is cool, but not cool like me, you know? <laughs> <laughs> those those uh, thinkers uh, uh, to read. Um, but the new way changed that. They, they brought it into the public eye. Um, Star Trek, Star Trek was, uh, yeah, one of the prominent examples. Uh, so what's really weird and like should tell you like what state science fiction was at the time, Gene Roddenberry did not pitch this as a sci-fi show originally. And not this is not to say it wasn't sci-fi at the time, but when explaining it, he used words like this is like an expedition to the West in a western and stuff like that. Like he was pitching this as this is basically a western in space, which is really funny because at this point we don't think of this at all for that. We think of Firefly, yeah. but it's just really interesting. Like he pitches a wagon adventure and seeing what's out there. Um, yeah. Um, yeah. So just, just to give you a little taste of uh, an episode, and, we'll, we'll talk about and like, we'll there's a lot of episodes, by the way, we can talk about. Um, we're we're also only gonna focus on TOS because TOS is um, TOS is relevant to this time period. Yeah. Um, but one episode that like because I watched the show a lot as a kid, one episode that always stuck with me was the City on Edge of Forever, which is possibly my favorite Star Trek episode, even in the later series. Uh, and it's this. So they find a gate, and by the way, there's gonna be some spoilers for this episode, but it's like. 50 years old. I still recommend it. But they 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 land on this planet and there's this gate and like it just starts showing like different time periods and the gate explains like if you jump through here you'll go to that time period. And at one point McCoy just runs it and uh, all of a sudden they can't contact the Enterprise anymore. McCoy did something that stops the Federation from uh, and I think it was explained through uh, whatever that like that planet was isolated from time, so it was still okay. So that's why they could still be there, which kind of plays into the whole. This was still kind of a cheesy time period, yeah. But like it didn't matter because I still love this episode. Um, so then they go, okay, Kirk and Spock are gonna go back to the exact moment that McCoy walked in and see if we could stop whatever he did and uh they go back and i it's like around the 1920s and they find a, a woman in charge of a like a helping care home and the like, kirk ends up kind of falling for her and uh it turns out later mccoy did too uh but that's important because the spock eventually looks at newspapers from the 1920s and finds out she dies in a car accident in two weeks and the reason why time changed is because she needs to die because if she doesn't die, she ends up leading a pacifist organization, which eventually causes um, the Americans to not enter World War II, which eventually causes the Nazis to invent the atomic bomb earlier, which means the Nazis win World War II and destroy the Earth. And like it's basically like Kirk dealing with do I kill this woman that besides feelings for her is an overall good person but also the world's going to be destroyed like and right weighing those two and eventually they do kill her like let her die and it is known to be the first curse word in television history being uttered it's not really a curse word by modern day but the last sentence of the episode is Kirk leaving and saying, let's get the hell out of here because he's so pissed. He's supposed to be like, he's freaking angry and whatever. Uh, I really liked that episode because to me, that was like the first take on time travel and showing this really 
to childhood me of like, this is my first interaction with time travel. But like even more than that, like looking at it historically, the other stuff, like, yeah, that, um, I think it also might have, I don't know, but it might have put Star Trek on the map because this was the second to last episode of season one. Um, yeah, it was fairly. Yeah, it was fairly early. Um, for example, the, the final line, let's get the hell out of here. You, you Using the word hell in that way was uh, explicit at the time. Um, and they did all kinds of other the, stuff. They did. The girl was not like a, like she was pretty progressive as a character even for men. So, yeah. Um, they also had the first interracial kiss. Uh, they, they questioned... Uh, uh, the Red Scare in general. Yeah, um, a real quick note on another episode that I think is a little longer. Um, like real quick. Yeah. Uh, there's they're like going into the neutral zone, just like with the Romulans and all that. And uh, they no one's seen a Romulan for a hundred years, according to the episode. And then a Romulan pops up on the screen, and it looks really similar to Spock. Um, like really similar because they have common ancestor and uh, some like a red shirt for lack of phrasing uh like a one-off character ends up being like you can't trust spock because he looks exactly like the enemy and like this was at the height of the red scare when that would happen on a tuesday <laughs> like like and uh kirk is basically saying you can't say that because spock's been with me for years blah 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 yeah. and like it's saying like you, just because you look like that doesn't mean you are like that. And that's really, I think that episode was like 64, 65. So like, yeah, uh, that and was crazy. While these episodes are very theatrical and usually have some big moral or soapbox moment uh, in almost every episode, at the same time, you could, you could probably roll a die and if it lands on a six, that means this episode is going to have some omnipotent being that for whatever reason loves Earth or or every member of the crew is going to get turned into like a, a slice of cheese or something. <laughs> it's it's a Western. Yeah, one of, one of the things uh, about this era is it didn't always super focus on the accuracy of the science, but on the style and the format they produced it in. So that it was, uh, uh, I mean, it was still cutting edge at the time and people who were watching it were like, like this is this is all incredible and new and super out there, but you know they they sometimes stretch it up a little bit more so that the general public can enjoy it. You know, uh, as much as I, I, I joke a lot about how this random thing has like a budget of five bucks. I think the budget of the first episode of Star Trek was no joke, like five or ten bucks, like because like the, the actual discs on the. The Those are hubcaps they took from next door because next door happens to be a used car lot, and there were some cars that just weren't selling, so they took them off, like with permission from them. But like, those are still hubcaps. <laughs> yeah. Oh. Yeah, and it definitely did rub off on people as the series continued on. For, well, after this series ended, like, there was a joke for a long time that like there's always going to be a Star Trek show on TV until like recently because like there was a really long time span between in the 2000s where I didn't. 
But other than that, yeah, and like there was still Star Trek. There's almost always Star Trek coming out since then. Um, but continuing, uh, we're going to move on to Doom. Um, yeah, and so neither of us have really read Doom or have seen the movie to completion. Uh, but Daniel, on the other hand, has read the movie and or or read the book. Yep, yeah, both yeah, of those. Um, so we're gonna have, we're gonna pass it off to Daniel. So, um, Dune is, uh, I think the best way to describe it is pretty interesting. Um, there's a lot of really weird things in the series. Um, you know, I read them when I was 12 or 13, which uh, I should probably reread them because I didn't understand a lot of what was going on at the time. But um, so basically, it takes place a few thousand years in the future, and then and that's where the first book starts. And then from there, it spans another few thousand years until the sixth or seventh book. I don't remember how many there are. Um, but it centers on this planet, Arrakis, also called Dune, which is inhabited by these giant sandworms. And they're on the planet mining spice, which is basically this drug, which has um, a lot of weird effects on people. Uh, they use it and the Spacing Guild uses it um, to basically mutate people into being, being able to see the future, which allows them to pilot faster than light uh, spaceships. And, and then there's all these, the secret organization of women who are basically selectively breeding people over the span of thousands of years to basically to achieve a superhuman essentially which they sort of do in the book um and the main character ends up being able to see the future uh and some of the later books um find out like the spice that they're mining and they, they keep having the, the, so the worms keep eating their their mining facilities and stuff and they find out that that's at the spice is actually part of the worms life cycle which is it's really confusing um I, I definitely recommend reading the first book, at least. Um, the rest of the books get kind of strange, but yeah, it's... Uh, awesome. Is there a copy of like a TV show for you? Yeah, there's... Yeah. there's uh, I think it's a movie. Oh, there's like a casting for it. There's a Dune movie actually has like really yeah. high quality people working on it. Well, like even more than that, it's directed by a villain on the main amount of solid movies recently. And another sci fi. You even have Patrick's. Oh, yeah. Um, the reason we bring this one up is, like we said before, um, uh, this era really helped bring sci fi into the mainstream, into the what is cool and whatnot. Um, uh, but, you know, it is a little bit curious, uh, as both of the presenters have not read it. And could I see a raise of hands if you read or seen the movie? Completion. <laughs> um, uh, so yeah, it's it hasn't been seen a lot. So why would I bring? Why would we put this on the slideshow if it's not as popular as Star Trek or something? Well, this was a major inspiration for Star Wars uh, and a lot of the other kind of space operas that came out in the era. Mm. Yeah, it's supposed to be like very clean, very futuristic, and like, yeah, look, like there's no like everything's made of like chrome, like like in yeah. But Dune uh, kind of like gave this idea to like so of a lot of people that like it can be like grimy and dirty and more like a Western too, and like not saying Dune's Western. And this inspired a certain man named George Lucas uh, to go with this aesthetic and make a certain planet called Tatooine, which isn't a big deal for Star Wars. Um, and even though Tatooine is very different from Doom, it still like this is a precursor in a way. And there's a lot of other really cool ideas in Doom as a whole. Yeah, it's magic again. Uh, kind of this. Uh, do you see any other parallels? 
Um, well, one interesting thing I was going to point out about Dune is, um, so like in Star Wars and stuff, there's a lot of, you know, and the other science fiction, the far future always has like artificial intelligence and computers and everything. In Dune, computers are completely illegal. And so they basically have people that they train to be basically function as computers because thinking machines are, are banned. Um, and that does, if I, if I remember correctly, uh, spark notes that I read, um, that does tie into the, um, uh, uh, the general uh, corporation kind of uh, high technology, low science by the court. No, high technology, low society by uh, Similar to 1984 and a couple of the upcoming stories as well, right? Where it's like corporate greed is for work that they drop. Yeah, and it's basically about how the emperor is, it, it, is secretly sort of um, supporting. Um, there's, there's like various houses, noble houses, and supporting the one house and trying to destroy his, his enemies. And he's supported by, um, I think it's CHOM or C H O A M or something. I don't remember what it stands for, but it's basically a, a, a corporate organization that was in charge of everything. Awesome. Um, okay. Thanks, Daniel. Again, uh, 6.30 Monday, right outside the reading room, book club. Uh, uh, then we jump forward to the 80s, uh, uh, when it's transitioning even closer to modern culture. Um, and we're going to start so, off with E.T. E. Because this would be really fun. So all of these stories that you mentioned, it's going to be like stuff like Clark and uh, Star Trek actually didn't, but uh, like this is a really positive movie overall and like we don't get that usually with an encounter of an alien uh and this movie's also a big deal because it made it kind of it wasn't the first Steven Spielberg movie but i think it kind of put Spielberg on the map a bit and fun facts the whole optimism thing that wasn't what it was going to be this movie has a what you know, the original script was really dark overall like uh and i'm kind of happy it didn't Uh, for E.T.? Yeah, just, just okay. Yeah, so if you don't know, E.T. is about um, a boy who finds an alien in the woods and takes him home and, like, takes care of him and bonds with him. Uh, it's more optimistic and kind of innocent. Uh, but, like, the one bad thing that happens in the movie is, like, the government kind of gets involved. It's not very optimistic there. But even then, like, they... And, like, E.T. says, like, phrases like, E.T. phone home because he just wants to go home. Like, he's not coming here to, like, conquer the earth or anything, like, in War of the Worlds. He's just, he's a traveler, and he's lost, and it's good. Um, so, like, the original, original script, if you ever heard of a little movie called, another movie that Spielberg wrote called Poltergeist? Um, that was this movie. The, the two were the same. Like, basically the movie starts with like the same thing. And then all of a sudden, I don't think, I don't remember if it was E.T., like the specific E.T. that did it, or if it was just one of his, a different E.T. But eventually the movie like becomes like, they're, the family's haunted by like these things levitating and stuff uh, because there's an alien in the house and they like want to take over. And it's just a very different tone because like he wanted to do Spielberg wanted to like make a horror movie for kids, I think was the idea, which I don't think really worked. And he eventually said, you know what, these are so totally different. I'm making them two different movies. It like has to be like that. And I'm really glad that happened because ET is kind of like fairly unique overall, like in terms of everything I just said. Um, but the re biggest reason why I brought it up, I think this is the moment that sci-fi became okay to like be a fan of because this was the highest grossing movie of all time for four for 11 years the movie that broke it was jurassic park 
for context. Like, it was a, yeah, it had to be a different movie that, like, is in the same consciousness to, like, break. Um, it even was up for Best Picture of the Year in the Oscars. It lost, I forget to what, but it was, like, another movie that, like, when I say it. I forget what it was, but if I remember, it was a number movie. It's like, okay, that also deserves it. Um, and thank God there was no sequel. <laughs> like any every other movie in the eighties, we're getting like we're getting a Terminator Five, like no joke, like, or Terminator Six. I mean, yeah. yeah, like I can't even keep track of sequels for some of these. ET is still on its own. It's still like especially with the eighties, where like sequels were like we got to make them, we got to keep pumping them out. There was an E.T. sequel that was going to go along the same tone of, like, E.T. was still going to be innocent, like, as a character, but it was still going to be darker. And Spielberg scrapped it because he's like, E.T. has to stay innocent. I can't do this to E.T. And good job, Spielberg. Um, so, yeah, like... Um, it should also be noted for like, these kind of uh, representatives. After sci-fi, after the new wave and sci-fi kind of hit the mainstream, um, you know, companies saw, hey, sci-fi actually kind of works. People don't just look at it as, oh, that's another sci-fi movie. They're like, Star Wars, that's an awesome movie. So they took it and they took it in all different directions. And you can see it's really hard to generalize it um, because it's on such a mass market. Another thing to jump in quick, uh, E.T. broke Star Wars' record. That should say something. Yeah. Like, Star Wars was the number one and then E.T. came along. Uh, uh, but yeah, just to show another point of view, uh, we have the Neuromancer, which is a popular story from the time. Um, now, the Neuromancer, very quickly, um, I did not read this story, but I know the gist of it. Daniel, did you read this story? Okay. Um, <laughs> uh, the Neuromancer um, is about these three characters in this uh, a future setting where, um, like, like in Dune, uh, technology is super advanced and there's these sprawling cities, but uh, the, the differences between the classes is huge. You're either super rich or you're super poor. Um, and it centers on these three characters, um, uh, one of which is a, uh, a hacker without work. Um, uh, an illusionist slash thief, which is interesting, um, and a uh, cyborg mercenary. And they're all hired by this secret organization to um, uh, collect the digital upload of uh, the hacker's old mentor, his mind, um, which is, you know, that sounds exciting on its own. And then later they go on, they get hired by the same mysterious person uh, to go into this um, uh, 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 this biodome uh, revolving around the Earth uh, called Freeside, uh, where the it's not a biodome. I see. It's not biodome. <laughs> so, a habitat, something. It's it, essentially a casino. Uh, uh, a casino or a um, a resort for the super rich, and it's implied that there's a ton of these around the earth, so that literally the distance between the poor and the rich is beyond the sky. Like it's it's crazy. Um, so they go up there, and their job is to uh, steal an AI um, uh, from a computer, hack it out, and then. Um, uh, they would be given more instructions past that. Um, does anyone want to read this at any point? Or am I good to spoil it? Any? Okay. The twist at the end is apparently it was the um, AI that had hired them the whole time. Uh, AIs are illegal to be put on like the free internet, to my understanding. Um, but it found a way to communicate with them and freed itself. And then it combined with this other AI called the, neuro, the uh, Neuromancer and became this even bigger threat. It, it did become a series, even though the author didn't want it to. Um, and it was a huge success. Uh, this completely defined the uh, cyberpunk genre. Um, 
although I think it it kind of co-defined it because uh, Blade Runner came two years before it, but this was much more thorough in you know error over movies. Um, uh, uh, and this defined a lot of the other like sub parts that don't have to do with specifically robots or cities. Because I, I think it's pretty much all um, Blade Runner covers as far as the sci-fi elements go. Um, but yeah, they, they um, uh, defined that and that was kind of a, a genre that carried on uh, going forward. Like, how did The Matrix start? It was uh, a hacker without work uh, getting found by this organization yeah. that needs them to do a thing to fight an AI. It's it's all very similar and it uh, continued on past that. Well. Yeah. Now for a very different story. <laughs> Another very, very different. different. Uh, so Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. Uh, so Douglas Adams' history is um, he eventually, he actually started as a doc writer on Doctor Who, which is really weird. And a lot of the good episodes of that Doctor, which is the fourth Doctor, happens to be written by Douglas Adams. Um, and uh, apparently the story is he was really, really, really drunk, which is the only way I think you can make this. Um, and he ended up collapsing in a park, looking up at the sky being like, huh, the galaxy is pretty tonight. And he was like looking at the stars and stuff. There should be a hitchhiker's guide to the galaxy and then pass that. <laughs> which makes the most sense about this series, I think. Yeah, so. The first, yeah, 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 it is all over the place, but the first book starts with, actually the first book starts with this woman, this girl is the smartest girl on the planet. She is going to make a very important, she is about to mail something that's very important and it could change history. And then she immediately gets hit by the car. <laughs> and then it's like, this is kind of how life is. And the next chapter is um, a guy, a, a, just a regular plain old guy who's in a bathroom. He walks outside and there's builders there and they say, we're bulldozing your house because we're building a road. Road's gonna go right here. Goodbye to your house. And he's like, nope, I'm not doing that. And he lays down on the ground. It's like, you realize we're like, have to legally run you over and they're like nope i'm staying here you can't run me i'm like that's like the first this is still the first chapter and then an alien spaceship comes up and says we're bulldozing this planet because we're building a road did you not get the memo like the which is the exact same phrase and in the first chapter the earth is destroyed <laughs> and like that should tell you this is very ridiculous, very ludicrous, all over the place. It has everything, like in the sci-fi. It, it says life is futile. It has time travel. There's space travel. There's at one point an interdimensional space invader arc. Um, it's kind of all over the place, but um, also 42 is the meaning of life and the the meaning, the answer to the question of the meaning of the life, the universe, and everything. That joke's been said a lot. There's a reason. Uh, this, I don't know if it's, I don't think it's the only satire. I don't even think it's the first satire. But this is definitely what people think of when they think of a sci-fi satire, just because the writer is a very unique writing style. And, like, he has jokes that he'll build up over the course of a book. And then he'll tell you the punchline and it will still be funny. I went into this book thinking I knew all the jokes and I still thought about um, It's a five book series, technically it's a six part book series. I haven't read the six, but um, they're all really solid. You can actually get it in this one book, which is how I have it. Um, but it kind of just embraced like the ideologies of like the universe is large yeah it's big yeah you're a tiny part of it and that's kind of okay uh and there's not a lot like it and i don't even think there's anything like it now uh yeah it, it the, is a really good point 
Um, Sky Pike, for the most, usually doesn't approach the whole nihilism side of science because uh, when you when you start looking at science as a whole, you start to realize uh, the scope of everything and how small you are relative to the entire universe. Um, and once you do that, a story feels a little bit less relevant. So, you know, they, they don't always take that into the story as a heavy element. Oh, that's interesting. Oh, yeah. Huh. That's really yeah. interesting. It's like the planet is like negative time spent in the 35th years, and like the universe is like that one in positive 35. <laughs> huh. Huh. Um, that's yeah, that is that is intriguing. But um, but yeah, this book kind of takes it, and they uh, are able to make a joke out of it. Um, uh, but yeah, I, uh, I feel like, I feel like we forgot one maybe. Oh. I mean, this is the last, the, there's no other, there's no other big 80s sci-fi movies, right? That we're forgetting. I think, yeah, that's, yeah, I think so too. yeah, that's, it's, oh, it's let, probably not. Let us be clear, by the way, if that, the that whole big jump and stuff. The 80s were all over the place. They we were. It's they really, really hard to we, categorize. We tried to make a scale because of how much, and we couldn't even make the scale. The, like, the, the <laughs> scope was. So, um. Yeah. Like, oh, Terminator yeah. and Robocop were around the same time, and they are totally opposite movies. Yeah. And then E.T. is a few years later. E.T. is three years after Alien. Yeah. Yeah, it was in... Yeah. Uh, no, we, so we did consider talking, actually, we yeah. considered talking about it, but we had to cut it out because we didn't have enough experience with it. Do you have? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Here, let's show it. And everybody just measured for you people at home. Yeah, and uh, Forbidden Planet was one of the big ones. We did advertise that we were going to show it, but unfortunately, we, we talked about a lot of stuff. Like we brought up Terminator. We were, we were, I was gonna. I want to talk about Terminator, but we thought we covered that in other things. Like as I said, the '80s were. There's a lot of facets, and that kind of goes into, but that kind of goes into like um, the '90s even, because like we were going to talk, we just, we were going to split the '90s up as a different time period, and like the '90s were kind of the, just continuing that, and even now we're just kind of continuing how we're like spread out with like a million different things. So we had to like kind of generalize as much as we could. Thank you. Okay. Well, now we kind of have to have a current advertisement, probably. All right. Yeah, let's, let's. Whoa! Whoa! Oh, right there. So, um, um, again, as, as we said before, as you guys closer and closer to um, uh, modern sci-fi, it kind of got further and further and harder and harder to generalize. There's a lot of trends that are kind of happening, but there's plenty of outliers and exceptions from those trends that we can't really say that it's a definitive 
this is what's happening during this era. And we can't, you definitely can't sum it up with just two or three. Like we, uh, we were trying and there was like, we got like five, yeah. just for the 2000s. Like, and. Right. And then in the two yeah. thousands, and then in the two thousands, we got the zombie craze for with twenty eight days later. We were going to talk about Deus Ex too, like, but. Oh, the world ending. And this is also the rise of the matter of fact, how I think with all of the is how like oh the environment was gonna come back to get us and the world was gonna fall. Yeah. Like, and there's tons of that. And then there's also superhero movies and yeah. there's horror movies. And and there's like the Matrix had three movies for some reason. Yeah. Uh uh and The Matrix kind of like the Matrix in the, uh, impacted filmmaking, but it didn't really impact the sci-fi genre weirdly, which is really weird because like people talk about its legacy, but it's really only in filmmaking. Like we were gonna have a slide of the Matrix, but then like there's no yeah, there's if, not if a lot of it in there that would be like saying this is the perfect and not maybe once we get more objective from a distance, yeah, uh, that's also why like, one, but subjectively 20, it's hard. That's why it's also 20 question mark because like yeah, it's we're we're still like yeah. it's 20 question mark question mark specifically. So oh this is the last slide. Yeah, no, this is yeah because like we, we decided like because we were all over the place with the 90s to now, because and again we were just gonna really do 90s and it's like but wait, the 90s not that dissimilar from now. But we don't know how to define this. Yeah, we really because it's. Uh, I mean, if you guys can think of any choice. Like a slide we were going to have was like, it was on my. Oh, yeah, this is this is more or less the end. Uh, if you guys have anything you want to discuss. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And we're playing like in like, the one year, like in the 90s as well. Like there are like 20 spaces. So, a lot. It's yeah. like, it's a, there's something about space as a, as like a setting that is allows for video games to even flourish. It's just, it's, it's just a thing to look at. And we were also talking about like a lot of this time period has been defined by the 80s, but it is distinct. So, yeah. we're, I Almost starting back. It's also the 80s, but it's like the one year was. Yeah. Uh, like but, the anti, like, but, yeah. But then we started embracing it again. Yeah. So, like, this right now is. Yeah. There were, especially since uh, video games were brought up, in games especially, but also with newer technologies in movie making, like uh, in computer graphics, right. the 90s and early 2000s were a time where all of those things were being experimented with a lot. And then the late 2000s were where those technologies had sort of plateaued in some areas. And so there was a lot less innovation with that variety of uh, and a lot more like just refining rather than making two sweeps for it. And we've just sort of started entering a new period of deep scoring because like now that uh, virtual reality and augmented reality are more widely available and on the uh, filmmaking side, uh, computer graphics have finally more things are able to be reach the far side of the Uncanny Valley. So we're starting to see new innovations again with a lot more CG mixed in with live action. So, yeah, but yeah. And it's not the, it doesn't feel the same as when that happened in the 90s. So like the reason why yeah. I was more yeah, we were trying to read something she wanted to say. Oh yeah, go ahead. Well a lot of the time where there's more anime movies and more people like anime because they were really in 
know, there's always been stuff I like, but like, I feel like it's been in the last couple of decades that more Western um, directors and writers have done stuff with anime. You know, like when Akira first came out in the West, it was this huge deal, and no one ever seen anything like it before. And nowadays, you have some, and nowadays a lot of sci fi anime works are just kind of mainstream. We're yeah. yeah, we're now getting uh, big budget live action anime remakes, which may or may not be a good thing, but it's definitely happening. Yeah, it's yeah, perfect for the point. Yeah. 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 Time period ends and goes to something else. Um, but the reason why like we decided to do this is like filmmaking wise, I think you can definitely and like video game development wise, I think you can definitely pinpoint a time period. But in terms of types of story, it's yeah. not really the case, which is why we did it. And I think it just might be that we're we're subjective. If if we're That'd looking at this cool. like a hundred years in the future, we might be able to be like, oh yeah, it's all it's all like super pessimistic, but um but like where we are right now we can we can't definitively place it um yeah yeah from Prometheus. yeah i mean that that kind of falls under the uh uh same pessimistic view that you can see in like a lot of the apocalyptic movies that have popped up uh, yeah yeah. 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 When came out a few years ago. Yeah, I think so. Um. But yeah, yeah, that pretty well reflects it. I'm not sure if that is definitively like the the defining uh, uh, trademark yeah. of our era, or if it's that's also was it like when we were trying to pick stuff, it's like it's hard to say because like yeah. we were gonna put Interstellar, but Interstellar came out recently enough that we can't see its influence. Yeah. Um. But yeah, is there anything? Uh, Inception was a very powerful sci-fi movie. Uh, although at the same time, it was kind of exceptional because I'm not sure if there's a lot of movies that. I mean, that's that's true. There yeah. are a significantly a distinct increase in flaws in our trailers. Well, okay. It, it did. It did do that. Yeah. That yeah. That yeah. Yeah. It was. It was kind of a pop yeah. media meme thing. And it definitely like a pop culture status thing. At least, maybe not as much as like an ET or something like that, but definitely it's there. Uh, well, yeah, what I was going to do for that is I was going to talk about Spider-Man 1 because I think the superhero craze started there. Yeah. And that definitely progressed into the MCU. Yeah, yeah. Well, with Star Trek, which is kind of a very surprising discovery. Like, Star Trek was extremely 
these belts consistent, such that like you can watch TOS, you can watch TNG, the assigned Voyager, the, the, the enterprise minus the worst parts. And like it has really good continuity with itself. And you can like watch a bit of the TNG to get context for something that happens in Voyager. And you can watch Enterprise to get something for context in TOS, which, uh, and but it's really, but it's funny to bring that up because like Discovery is almost saying no to that. Like it's almost, it's it's weird. It's, Although the serial fiction is kind of old when it comes to sci-fi as well. Yeah. I mean, the TV series and movies and even novels. It is across uh, media, that's a good point. Uh, and it was a transmedia connected universe before the huh. that's, um, Yeah, no, that's also yeah. you're speaking to enterprise connected to us, also you can just like things that Jadia Dax would reference in Deep Space Nine about her folks who are alive during the events of Enterprise and TOS. Yeah. And those things align with things that happened that had already happened in TOS and had it been rich enough for enterprise, but would be. It's an interesting conversation that he reached out to um, the Magic Spell Studio building. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then see what the students that are working on now, what they're thinking about, and see where they are, and see you are, and, and, you know, what they are working on, what they do. They're so as a game design student who is currently on co-op and working with a company that is making VR games, um, there are some ambitious projects in store. I can't talk too much about it, but um, uh, there there has been a lot of um, for like AAA, like the big video games. We have um, in a few years we're going to get a. Uh, Two games that right now we don't know anything about, but one of them is uh, Cyberpunk 2077, which is going to continue to Cyberpunk, Step, which is kind of cool, and Starfield, which we literally know nothing about, but there's satellite in it. We can have Zach as the last comment. Okay, go for it. Yeah. Yes. Like, it's another one where we have very few details, but the creators talked about uh, it having like um, cyborg, many you know, like cyborg implant stuff and artificial intelligence. And when you have artificial intelligence in components that are integrated into your body, and I don't know where they're going with this because we just started to get some details about it, but I can't wait to see what they're talking about. Yeah, okay. That's sweet. Cool. Logan, take it over. All right, thank you, uh, Marty and Dr. Brown. <laughs> <laughs> All right, then, just um, closing announcements before we go. The poll for our movie poll for determining on the dates we'll be seeing our all of our future outings for the rest of the semester has been both have been published both on the Facebook and the Twitter. Make sure you go vote on that. Um, Again, and book club will be starting to reach out to its end next week. If you want to learn more about book club uh, and its reading, talk to this guy over there. He's friendly. Starfest registrations are now open. So if you want to attend RT's biggest sci-fi convention, go ahead. And But if you don't want to spend money, then you can always just volunteer with us too. That is also currently open. And then, of course, next week we'll be having our mission on Biopunk. All right, then. Thank you very much for attending and have a good night.